Hi, everyone. I'm uh, Sarah Nichols, Assistant Professor at Rice School of Architecture. And on behalf of the Lectures Committee and Co-Chair Brittany Utting, uh, I'm very happy to welcome you all to the second lecture, or the third lecture, actually, of the fall series on race, social justice, and allyship. Um, I'm really happy to be introducing our speakers today. Ilse Wolf is an architect, scholar, and writer who's the co-director of Wolf Architects and the founder of the research, activism, and design organization, Open House Architecture. OHA hosts exhibitions, interventions, publications, and talks with artists, activists, and scholars in order to foster public discourse on the city, space, and personhood. In 2017, Ilse received an international prize for scholarly works in modern and contemporary art and architecture in Rome for her book, Unstitching Rex True Form, the story of a garment factory in Cape Town and its afterlife. In 2018, she was shortlisted for the Architectural Review's Mora Gemmel Award, and between 2017 and 2019, she was a fellow at the University of the Western Cape Center for Humanities Research. She also co-founded co Pumflet, and a publication for art and architecture. Heinrich Wolf is an architect, writer, educator, and the other co-director of Wolf Architects. His research focuses on 20th century architecture in the third world, innovation in architecture at times of social change and housing in South Africa. He's received awards, including the Daimler Chrysler Award for South African architecture, the Lubetkin Award, and in 2000, 2011, he was elected as designer of the future by the Wouter Mikmak Foundation. Heinrich's been a visiting professor at ETH Zurich, at IUAV in Venice, and at Wash U, and he's been an adjunct assistant professor at the University of Cape Town. He's the author of Architecture at a Time of Social Change, by, published by Teu Delft in 2012, which considers post-apartheid architecture in South Africa and the new role of the architect. Their practice together, Wolf Architects, is a design studio concerned with developing an architectural practice of consequence through the mediums of design, advocacy, research, and documentation. The work of the practice has been included in many international exhibitions, including the Venice Biennale, the Shenzhen Biennale, uh, the, at the Louisiana Museum of Modern Art, and the Chicago Architectural Biennale, as well as the Sao Paulo Biennale and the South American Architecture Biennale. So we're really pleased to have Ilza and Heinrich here today because their, worth, their work both independently and together provides a really powerful vision of architectural practice as an agent for change, for addressing social inequity through scholarship and built work, documenting the erasure of indigenous landscapes and narratives. They really take pains to point out that their work is situated within a network of employees and collaborators who represent and deploy diverse practices, including photography, art, film, and writing, uh, expanding the notion of practice to encompass social justice advocacy, research, and scholarship, as well as conceptual art. So this is fitting uh, really perfectly, I would say, within the aims of our lecture series uh, this semester, which is kind of taking on all of what we are trying to do at once, both presenting a view of how research uh, can document injustice as well as address it both through built work, well, or built work and advocacy, uh, as well as research. So Ilza and Heinrich, thank you so much uh, for joining us. So before I hand it off to you, just a quick note to uh, everyone about the Q&A. As we've done for the first two lectures this semester, we're hosting this as a webinar, but for those of you joining us the first time, it means that participants can ask questions by typing them into the Q&A box that you'll find at the bottom of your Zoom window. Uh, then when the lecture is finished, our graduate student Mei Okimoto will, ask, will act as the moderator asking questions on behalf of audience members selecting and reading them aloud for our speakers to answer. All right, I'll hand this over to Ilza and Heinrich. Thank you again and welcome. Well, thank you very, very much for that beautiful introduction. We are so happy to be part of this lecture series. Um, part of me is lamenting the fact that we are not in Houston. Part of me is lamenting the fact that we are, uh, you know, part of me is, is happy to be in the cozy surrounds of our studio and uh, in Cape Town. And um, so I, I'm personally torn by the fact that we are, you know, not in the city, but at the same time, it, it offers other opportunities of being present other, other, otherwise. So thank you for the invitation. Thanks. 
So, um, yes. Tonight you're finding us in our studio space and we've um, developed the space around us just to give everybody a quick sort of a glimpse into the kinds of projects that we that we involved in. But we thought that in terms of how we would like to frame our lecture tonight, we would like to pay homage to the kinds of details that we've managed to uncover through various research practices and um, design practices. So we've called this talk about paying attention. And um, the idea is to think through how can we um, pay attention to the small details in the social fabrics of society, details that have often um, been, uh, you know, not, not given specific presence to, and in that way, begin to think through an alternative practice for restoring and um, recuperating some of, lost, some of the lost communal, communal practices. In essence, trying to think through what is, what, how do we gather wisdom um, through thinking through space differently. Um, what, what happens when we pay attention to details and um, uh, ideas that have been lost through um, various kinds of political hegemonies is that we are confronted with often very uncomfortable questions of race, coloniality, and gender. And what this allowed us, what this discomfort allowed, allowed us to, to, to um, explore is that one needs to move through this discomfort. And we are very interested in thinking through what Edward Glissant talks about. How does one um, move through the world um, while trembling through it? One can only understand the world if one trembles with it. And through that kind of uncomfortable um, discomfort and these kinds of very important questions, we actually begin to think through an alternative way of um, thinking about space and then inserting it often very much in the studies of blackness. And our practice is in essence, a kind of a critical analysis in the frame of Fred Mota of anti-blackness, but at the same time, thinking through the attentions of, um, of celebrating the very specific details of, of blackness. So it is this kind of sense of how do we begin to be critical of anti-blackness in the practice, especially within the um, studies of space, but at the same time begin to celebrate the joys of um, what blackness brings to the discipline. We've been very um, immersed ourselves in various kinds of writings around this, um, very, some of it completely outside the world of architectural, um, sort of the traditional realms of architectural thinking. So tonight we'll speak a little bit about our engagements with the work of Bessie Head, a writer from, from South Africa and Botswana. We'll um, link that to some, some of the explorations around jazz and um, particular cinema that we looked at. And then we'll think through how did, how, what are the kind of mappings that we've made in the city through um, addressing economic justice as well, and how that then begins to percolate our, our bold practice and our spatial interventions. I don't know why I only put this in, but this is just a fun graphic of, <laughs> of us. Um, we um, are the principals of a um, studio in Cape Town. Um, and we are surrounded, very, very blessed to be surrounded by amazing colleagues who work with us collaborative, collaboratively and bring ideas, bring skill, and bring their own traditions to the work of this practice. So um, uh, even though you know, this image sort of talks about the two of us, we actually represent a, an entire team of people in the office and also family. And I must also just <laughs> thank my mother for um, standing in for us in terms of our parenting situation tonight, my mother Brenda Damu. Um, so we are supported by incredible people um, and we are happy to represent um, everybody in, in, in that sense. 
This image is a very important image for our practice. It is an image taken by um, Paul Grendon, a photographer who's not with us um, anymore. He passed away last year, sadly. But it's an image of Katrina Majit, the builder and the architect of this dwelling that we see in, in this image, a dwelling that is situated in a place called Sundrift in the Makwaland, um, quite north of the country bordering on Namibia. What this image represented to us is an image of how can we construct architecture um, in a very empowered way and in a very um, resilient way through strength, whilst at the same time thinking of architecture not as the ultimate construction. So what we see in this image is Katrina Majit building a structure around her belongings already inside the building. The traditional architectural discipline um, and the pedagogy around it asks us often to do it the other way around, to build and construct and design a building with an abstract notion of the program, of the inhabitants and of the details that would inhabit the space um, in the future that we are constructing. The lesson that we're learning from Katrina Majit in this image is that we should conceptualize it the other way around, whereas you recuperate your belongings, and in this case, even a family member inside, already inside the, the dwelling, recuperate people, your resources, your belongings, um, and then construct an architecture around that. And um, for us, this image has been quite an um, an epiphany, um, and it is a kind of a, 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 it sets the stage for how we think through architectural um, design um, um, as, as, a, as a prolonged trajectory. Next slide. Um, in terms of thinking about research, um, what we found with this project, which I'm going to explore now, um, is that research is not necessarily a um, a product of a production of gathering knowledge. It is a practice and it is a sense of a methodology of enacting some of the knowledge and the wisdom that one gains through research. We were invited by the curators, Yosome Amuno, Paolo Tevares, and Sepaki Angiyama to produce a research project for the Architectural Biennial in Chicago um, towards the end of 2018. We submitted a proposal that was in essence not a proposal for an object, but it was a proposal for a methodology based on a series of other interventions that we already, um, already implemented through a publication and um, spatial intervention program for conflict. And what we in essence um, pr proposed to the curators is to surround ourselves with um, and immerse ourselves in the work of the writer Bessie Head, a South African woman um, that was born in the mid-1930s and was subjected to quite brutal life experience in the party government in South Africa and eventually she exiled herself to Botswana where she writ, wrote books and novels mainly and in her own words where she was mainly concerned with the manner in which people the people lost their land. And when we immersed ourselves in the work of this event, we discovered that there are many correlations to um, the ideas that we had around land and um, how one can begin to restore certain communal practices through spatial interventions. We discovered that she built and constructed her own house in Sarowe, and this is an image of what the house looks like today. Um, the house was called Rain Clouds, and was essentially um, built from the resources of a third novel called The Rain Clouds Gather. What you see on this slide is a plan of the house, um, constructed in 1969, and um, the house is, in essence, is not too different from the very familiar RDP styled council government issue houses that we are very familiar with in Southern Africa. 
But the fundamental difference of this house is the fact that you enter the house from the kitchen. So once you walk up to the, the house um, through a gate uh, along a row of gooseberries, you enter the house into a room, which is the kitchen. And from the kitchen, you move into the other rooms, which is um, a bedroom and a dining room, a bathroom to one side. And in this room was Bessie Head's house and Bessie Head's bedroom, as well as her writing room. When I saw this plan, I really, in essence, thought that this is a kind of a, an, um, a subversion, actually, of what we um, are used to. When you look at the house from the outside, it is exactly like the house that I know my grandparents and um, other family members would have, would have had. But when you look at the plan, there's a fundamental shift in the way you enter the home, very direct way. Even though the practice of entering the, the homes that we all grew up with would have been from the back, where you would enter the house from the kitchen anyway, um, if you were familiar with a family or if you were a family member. Only people that were not familiar with a family would have entered the house from the front door, which would then lead into a front room and then into the various bedrooms. So entering the room from the kitchen for me was an, an extreme architectural contribution that Bessie Head then um, provides for the discipline. And I needed, to, we needed to pay homage to that contribution within the frame of the architecture by Annie. But more so, Bessie Head was also concerned with actual land and the restoration of land through agriculture. Um, she developed her own garden around her house and um, had to also live from the proceeds of the productive garden. But she was part of a communal gardening uh, volunteer group in the, in the late 60s and 70s, where the, the, the garden became the site for, um, for, for, for practicing friendship, com camaraderie, and also um, thinking through um, the politics at the time. So Summer Flowers begins to uh, carry these stories that Bessie had um, um, uh, kind of exemplifies through her spatial practice of her house and her garden and um, more so it begins to tease out other contributors to that to that discussion um, some of them being Saul Pleike and Robert Sabukwe. Saul Pleike was is also an integral figure in the story because um, Bessie Head wrote that um, wrote a for forward to Saul Pleike's um, republication of Native Life. And for some of you who don't know, Native Life was a document, one of the first documents um, of the destruction of the Native Land, Land Act in 1913. So there's a correlation between the work of Bessie Head, Saul Pleike, a historical figure for her, definitely at the time, and also kind of the enduring practice of horse removals um, that we still uh, experience today. But what we also find in the work of Bessie Head is that at the time that South Africa, her country of birth, was experiencing some of the most brutal forced removals in 1969, um, mid-60s through, through to the late 70s and 80s, we find a group of people um, working in a garden, producing an agricultural landscape, and we find in her an individual contribution or a new contribution to an architectural domestic house. So the juxtapositioning of the destruction of, um, of, of communal practices and neighborhoods in, a, in her um, birth country contrasted with the kind of restorative work that she was doing in Botswana was kind of a powerful signifier for us. Um, and something that we still carry in our practice, that these two things can coexist um, at the same time. We produced a film, and some of the film, this is a, a still from the film where we documented our, um, our methodology of gathering plant clippings from forced removal sites in Cape Town and Serowe, and um, in, and then sort of overlaying that documentation process into the way we recorded our house. Um, 
So these are stills from the film, Summer Flowers, where um, we photographed and documented um, the various objects and the various parts of, um, of, of, the, of the research, the house being one of the main objects. And then visiting the Kama Museum um, and our conversations with the Bessie Head Trust where again we were able to find some beautiful images of the house and um, images of the garden and um, for those who don't know Bessie Head wrote many many letters to friends documenting her own struggle personal struggle and the political struggle um, all of these objects and all of these stories emanating from this particular house um, what we also found is that the Botswana government declared the house a national heritage site and the Basie Head Trust is currently spearheading that particular process. What we see in this image is um, a, a photograph of Basie Head. We also see a photograph of Saul Plyke, um, which she, she, she adored his work and she found a lot of um, resonance in her work. And she said that Saul Plyke's books um, provided a missing link in many Black South Africans' um, uh, consciousness of knowledge about history in, in South Africa, particularly to pertaining to how people lost their land and, and, their, and, their, and, their, and their belongings to the, to, to the apartheid state. Some of the other documentation processes where we worked with children, we held workshops in our office and um, we um, you know, extended this research to engage with um, a wider public Part of what we're trying to do in the office is to really provide a public culture around research and around um, what we actually try and do. So these are images of some of those events that we, that we occurred. And um, one of the other object, um, um, part of this research is the publication. So for those who don't know, but um, South Africa has a very tired relationship with architectural publication. We have at the moment, we don't have an architectural publication. It, is, it died suddenly. But um, the publication kind of scene in South Africa is extremely um, white and it's male. And there are no stories of the historical links with architecture or the politicized nature of South Africa. And part of making this publication is to be critical of that distinct um, sort of anti-blackness in the, in the publication sense of, of, of the South African scene in, and also in the kind of frame of, of Fred Moten, but also begin to celebrate um, some black architects and women in particular that made a contribution but are not seen or not seen as part of the discipline. So the publication, which is this um, pamphlet, um, is a series, serial publication, essentially a series of meditations on the research and on particular people. Um, and you'll find the plan as a kind of a key obsession in this particular publication. The publication also um, has these pressed flower clippings. So the methodology of gathering flowers, pressing them with um, telephone books, in a kind of a performative nature, the same way that Saul Plyke is believed to have gathered actual flower material um, to re record um, how um, dispossession took place in South Africa in, for, his, for his book. We enacted that performance for pamphlet and to plant fragments from District 6, Rotia Village, um, from Bessie Head's house in Saroe, um, as well as um, uh, Kirstenbosch and other areas around Cape Town. And essentially what we then ended up with was a kind of a map of this methodology and this, um, all these kind of research gatherings. And this map was then, uh, um, you know, collaged together to produce a large scale mural, which we, which is part of it is behind us. Um, and which was then displayed at the biennial. Um, this is a, a, a representation of the space in Chicago where we conceived of a, a conversation space um, and conceived of as a space where you could enter the book that we made, um, but also immerse yourself in the map that we just produced um, and also page through some of the 
the raw material that we found, which is the books, Bessie Head's books, or Glyke's books, um, and the screening of the film and so on. This is a key image that Heinrich took at the biannual, which is really the, ex the example that we were trying to achieve where um, the space is a conversation space where uh, it draws together people, like-minded people. So um, at a key moment during the biennial, we were lucky enough to sit with our neighbors in the space, which was the Rewak um, Foundation in Palestine. And we were able to exchange their struggle um, in Palestine with our struggle in South Africa through this idea of landscape, plant material, politics of uh, key figures. Um, and the space was set up for something exactly like this. And we were very happy. Um, so what armory in the, in the yellow shirt. Um. Okay, so I hand over to Heidi. Uh, this is a, a project uh, in the interest of time, I'll maybe just be brief, uh, but it was a project that ran absolutely concurrently with the exhibition in Chicago. So this again was an invitation by the curators of the Sao Paulo Architectural Biennial, uh, who invited us to collaborate with a man called Elio Menezes that we did not know from a bar of soap, but we were very, very happy to work with him. Um, uh, he's a sociologist and a curator um, and uh, uh, Brazilian significantly and uh, through his eyes we in a way looked at Sao Paulo and some of the issues around the exhibition venue which was the SESC building designed by uh, Paulo Mendes de Rocha and PBBM uh, in uh, the Avenue 24th of May which is a, a cultural institution that is uh, I think a fairly fantastic Brazilian institution in that for a certain union of workers, they basically provide medical facilities, cultural facilities, discussion forums, exhibition spaces, etc. And the biennial was to be held in that building. Um, but um, Ilio pointed out to us that right across the road is a building called Galeria do Reggae, um, a shopping mall of a sort, which um, uh, uh, really houses uh, uh, is a cultural institution of a, another sort. So the one is sort of an official one promoting cultural attitudes, the other one's maybe a bit more commercial, but with uh, clothing uh, very imported from African countries, hair care, all of those sorts of practices, in a way talking about a cultural institution. Um, but that these two institutions, although they're right across the road from each other, have very little to do with each other. And um, we were challenged in a way by Elio to collaborate, to find a bridging between these two, to begin to open a conversation. And the, the figure that began to intrigue us was this figure of women who come from the hairdressing shops that's up on the fourth floor in Galeria do Reggae, who come down out onto the street to solicit people to come inside for hair care. And this, this sense of a, an inviting figure that comes and invites people to participate, really intrigued us. So we made two installations, one inside the um, SESC, the uh, cultural institution, and we brought one of the, we replicated a hairdressing station, a hairdressing salon inside the building with a series of hairstyles and an image designed by our office. Um, and then in the street, we made this figure that is sort of flying there in the sky between the two levels um, with some of the same hairstyles on there and so on. That's a sort of uh, colorfully dressed uh, figure, so to speak, it's suspended between the two buildings. So from the gallery level at the ACSC, one looks out onto it, and from the Galeria do Reggae that has this big open mouth, we look onto this figure as well. But this figure begins to try and find a midpoint between the various practices of clothing and hair and uh, uh, everyday life practices and the sort of officially sanctioned uh, programs of the SCSC. Um, I'll maybe just leave it at that. Okay. So um, we move on to a kind of a, a project um, again around restorative spatial justice, but also this idea of homage. 
So in South Africa, we have a situation where a lot of the heritage is goes unacknowledged, and um, buildings become, you know, revamped or uh, oftentimes demolished without taking real kind of um, without reckoning really with the past. So this idea of a past where there were kind of um, you know erasures is still continuing in a sense, um, and we. We are interested in the kind of buildings that remain still in our in our public realm that have stories to tell and that, uh, that potentially can give us more wisdom of how to intervene um, with our build projects. So, what I'm going to show is a film. Uh, but before we play the film, I must maybe just give a background. But um, the Lakshrama Cinema um, is a cinema in very close to our office, about a 20 minutes drive, 15 minutes drive. But um, it, it is an iconic cultural institution in Cape Town. Um, I know about the Lakshadama Cinema because my aunties and uncles all went there to go and see the most important um, popular music acts of their time in the 70s, for instance, um, Aretha Franklin was here, well, the, whether that's an urban myth, we will never know, but um, she was, she, she performed here, yeah, um, Eartha Kitt performed, um, and Dusty Springfield, Otis Redding, so all the important American um, soul singers potentially performed here, yeah, as well as very important um, South African singers. And the figure that we then um, built our research around was a saxophonist called Winston Mankunku Ngozi, who wrote a very, very important um, song for um, the time called Yakalin Komo. And Yakalin Komo is an important uh, political song. Some even argue that it precedes the kind of black consciousness writings um, of its time, or it, it runs parallel to Pico's writings of, of black consciousness. Um, but it is believed that Ngozi uh, Malkumpu debuted the album at the Lakshadama Cinema. So the significance of this building as a cultural institution is, in our opinion, extremely high, yet the building is currently vacant. It is currently being conceived of as a Islamic school, a campus for Islam and for the neighboring, um, for the neighborhood. And its past as a entertainment area is completely haram at the moment. So um, they are, uh, films are not being are not allowed to be projected, and as well as live music is not allowed in the space for a pedagogical site for Islam. We're not entirely critical of the new um, space, of the new use of the space. In fact, we welcome and embrace the neighborhood use of this building, but we do find that we needed to pause and almost construct a kind of a funeral for the Lakshrama to kind of pay homage to its very important past life as a cultural institution. So part of our research produced a little film, which I will play now. And the film depicts that event, which was the funeral and the procession band um, um, along, along the road, which culminated at a cafe where in our society, in our culture, after every funeral, we have after tears, which is a kind of a event where the family share tea and cake and, um, you know, have a, um, a light moment after the funeral. So let me play this, um, play this now. them standing on the back stage yeah. on the side there like you can distinctly see that wall um, with Zane Adams, Sally Pixon, <laughs> Aviva Pelham, um, Sergei he was the conductor for the 
kahit pala mali ko upas ko lang okay. na pinunayin ko yun yeah. so yeah and it's like in the lounge at home oh wow yeah so it's great movies they took off the lights so yeah there were all those those parkings that I showed you at the back mm-hmm. those guys they were hanging there yeah <laughs> Moving into a vault project um, that we are currently in the kind of you know, um, thoughts of implementing is that we were commissioned by the University of the Western Cape to um, think with them um, what would be the spatial um, equivalent of a center for their humanities research and um, for the, for the past three years, we've been working with them in quite a profound way to think through what that is. So the University of the Western Cape has um, acquired a building from the provincial government, which is a, the building that you see on the screen, which is a um, old union government school. Um, the one side of the building, which you see now, is right on the street, the Great Moor Street, and according to the group areas map, that street was the exact um, border for the white areas. So the, the school actually 
was on the edge of what was declared a white group area um, during the apartheid forced removals. And on the other side of the street, it was a declared for non-whites, non black people. Um, and it's significant, the history um, of that, that spatial history is significant in reconceiving the space because University of the Western Cape was conceived as a black university um, during the apartheid laws of education. And to be asked to conceive a, an art space with this kind of spatial history and this trajectory is um, a wonderful kind of methodology or kind of a, um, a way of, of, of entering the space. So again, we made a, a small publication called um, Learning from UWC, Making Space, Performing Liberation. And it is essentially a notebook of how we would approach this, um, conceptually approach this. So I'm going to just um, provide some of the notes that we, that we provided for, for the University of that. So one of the questions we asked is that, considering the making of space as an act of liberation, how have freedoms been performed through the making of space at the University of the Western Cape, through music, through puppetry arts, and through film and media? How do artists and scholars of the Center for Humanities Research at UWC continue performance of spatial liberation in the use of making space? So how do they imagine old rooms for new creative practices was one of the questions that we asked. Um, how does one perform space rather than just um, in a kind of a tectonic way make space? Um, and how does one do that simultaneously looking at the puppetry arts uh, legacy of UWC and a very particular tectonic emerges through um, the work of the Wakanda Collective for instance, and um, the theater productions at University of the Western Cape. Um, the image that I showed right in the beginning of Katrina Majit um, holding the Mikey says in Sundrift and taken by Paul Grendon became the obsession for this project and is essentially where the image, um, out, of, out of this archive that the image came out of because Paul Grendon was associated with the University of the Western Cape. He was a fellow at the CHR at the time. And essentially, how does one begin to, um, you know, be part of the conversation of um, building the resources around which this building would then be built? Um, we wanted to make with this building rooms that listen rather than um, just dictate how it should be used. And we wanted to extend how performance can be used as a spatial liberation for, um, for the city as a whole, as a whole. Significantly, this building would be the first um, presence that the University of Western Cape has outside of, um, outside of where it currently is, which is in the Balboa Metropole, very far from the city center or the historic center of Cape Town. Um, and we wanted to understand um, what, what, that, what that spatial um, you know, intervention in the city would be. We wanted to make a space that's popular rather than lofty. And we wanted to make space that sometimes is even too small. Some of the, some of the major jazz um, spaces in Cape Town are actually spaces that are too small for the, for the audiences. Um, for instance, um, Tagore's in Observatory comes to mind when thinking through what a space for, um, for music would be like. This is a map of um, the setting, very um, important setting, a very extravagant setting. The building is situated there with Cape with the Table Mountain as a backdrop and the harbor in the front. Um, this is a image of the kind of artwork that would emerge out of this, out of this project. Um, a collaboration between the Kwanda Puppeteers and Handspring Puppet Company. Um, where the production of puppetry arts is, is one of the main concerns. Another image of how the building sits um, squarely with these two major views out, um, um, one to the harbor and one to the city. Um, its socio-political context is very important. For instance, um, Woodstock is the site of major evictions at the time. Um, and still is a site for high speculative capital around, um, around property. 
and we needed, needed to understand what is the ethics around refurbishment of an old building and with um, uh, you know with the university as a kind of patron one of the one of the uh, interventions that we staged at the at the at the building was a clean up day where the university's vice chancellor the rector of the university all the key leadership of the building was there to clean up with brooms and skips the buildings and at the same time being there to attend to any questions that the neighbor neighbors would have about this building um, essentially thinking through the ethics of neighborliness from an institutional point of view um, as part of, 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 of claiming custodianship of the building rather than only ownership of, of, a, of a derelict site. I'm not going to go through all the, um, all the major moves that we made, but essentially we're creating a new foyer that would allow for a performative space into a courtyard space um, that would stage all kinds of events. Um, theatre productions, music productions and scholarly work. Um, the foyer becomes a threshold between the old um, neighbourhood, the um, apartheid boundary and as well as becomes a, the, the kind of public space of, 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 of the building. It's an image of the new lobby that we're envisioning for the site. And then just to round off this, um, this this set of images is another image from the archive where we looked at um, this particular architecture where in the backdrop of, of a colonial setting, this is a painting from the 1800s by, um, I forget the painter now, but it is of um, Malay traders in one of the squares in Cape Town, where, you know, there's a lesson in how, how does one make space, which is um, about some kind of a commercial, um, uh, exchange, but it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not a kind of a major dominant feature of the building. There's a collective, um, you know, gathering under this architecture. And upon entering, as this figure is, one needs to, um, uh, you know, embrace a performativity of humility um, because the people inside um, and people in, in the neighborhood um, is, is also kind of rightly so suspicious of anyone entering the space. So there's a kind of a negotiation that one needs to set up between how does one approach and enter a, a new kind of a site within the backdrop of these colonial buildings in Cape Town. There's an archive of how does one make space and collective action and, and trade. The, the, the next one is a series of, of um, um, <laughs> We, uh, as a series of projects where we're trying to think through a uh, contemporary city and trying to think of some of the main forces, um, the main forces uh, driving inequity in our city, uh, and also trying to think of how people live in the context of such inequity. So the, the first project um, or first research project is one that uh, we call the crime of our time now you may or may not know that apartheid was labeled as a crime against humanity but since the era of apartheid um, inequality has escalated substantially uh, it's gotten worse um, and the three most unequal cities in the world are all located in south africa so the escalation of the inequality of apartheid era to a greater inequality today must be the crime of our time. And the fact that architects and urban planners are complicit in the production of the mechanisms of such inequality, of course, is of enormous concern. Um, so one is we try to work out how that occurs, and two is how to undo it. So, um, uh, you know, and in... Uh, Mot Fred Moten's language, this is certainly a project trying to work out um, you know, what anti-blackness is about in our city, since inequality the, uh, uh, has a distinct racial dimension. It is as much a study about economics as it is about anti-blackness. Um, so what we did is um, we did a study that basically, you know, and I'll summarize and be quite brief about this, but shows how contemporary capitalism uses the morphology of the apartheid city. So here in this slide, you see an aerial photograph of an area called Langa, a neighborhood in Cape Town, 
that is enabled in the spirit of American neighborhood planning, a distinct planning unit. You can see here surrounded by big roads and so on and distinct from the other units. But what is not so evident in an aerial photograph is that this neighborhood is overlaid with something else and that is race. Um, during apartheid, this was for black South Africans. This area was for white South Africans. And this area uh, was for mixed race, or as it was named, colored South Africans. Um, now we tried to find a drawing methodology to illustrate exactly how this is done. So what we've done is that we follow the suggestion of Irit Rogov in the Free, uh, the free Thought Collective. And that is that infrastructure can disconnect as much as it can connect. Um, and in that sense, what we're doing in drawing the city is we're not drawing the capacity of infrastructure to connect if it also disconnects. So if we have a highway like we have and yeah, national highway running through here. In the one direction, it certainly connects at a national scale, but in the other direction, at a neighborhood scale, it disconnects. So we're drawing it in black because the, the function of this um, infrastructure is to disconnect at one level. Um, then what we're doing is that the spaces that's free and public, we make white, so the streets and so on, so that one can see what is truly public. And then every individual property, we color a different color so that we can see the scale of residential properties here versus say the scale of industrial properties there. But in the morphology of this, you can see this is a 1930s layout um, and this is typical of apartheid. So this was done when South Africa was still a British colony um, uh, and before the era of Grand Apartheid, but you can see uh, very few entrances into this area that is not unlike the conception of neighborhood planning internationally, but of course overlaid with uh, the apartheid state's mechanisms. This was where military control could be exercised at the entry to these neighborhoods. And when there's civil unrest, you can simply clamp down on it by closing down the road and exercising military control. So you often find these neighborhoods as the called townships, uh, like Kailicha today, still has a military base right at its entrance um, with uh, guard towers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the the segregation of this neighbourhood from others very clear, and you can see these vast areas of um, sewage plants and so on that segregate neighbourhoods are very clear. The buffer zones are very clear. But what you can see in this apartheid era model is a plethora of land ownership. Um, uh, this is perhaps its contemporary condition rather than its apartheid era condition but you see a whole lot of individual properties owned by a whole lot of individuals. And I'm showing this to shed light on this, which is exactly to the same scale. This is an area called Century City, um, a commercial development with residential rights, office rights, shopping center rights, amusement parks, uh, all sorts of things here. But if one uh, uses the same drawing convention to analyze it, you see a very strange thing, massive, disconnection between an area um, with uh, same racial kind of dimension to it. Um, but what you're seeing here is in essence one property uh, owned by one uh, land uh, uh, owner, uh, well, uh, uh, two landowners. But um, what you find is this is a post-apartheid sort of contemporary capitalist configuration of the city where very large portions of the city and huge property rights, commercial, residential uh, rights are amassed and given to the hands of a very, very small minority of controllers compared to say just the neighborhood behind it. And again, you find a very tenuous entry there, single entry there, an entry there. So this whole contemporary development has four entrances just like Langa Township which shows a certain kind of a fortification repeating itself. And in essence, what you have is hyper, hyper privilege amassed in the masses of the few. So these are urban planning devices used for um, monopolizing urban opportunity. And we're very, very concerned about the escalation of formations like this now city, where we are giving um, uh, 
one company, two companies, the right to amass urban opportunity. So here you have the center of Cape Town. You find uh, one property here uh, owned by a property developer and a pension fund. Another property owned by the harbors, but again, controlled by borders and so on. And then here you find the, uh, the city of Cape Town and you can see the plethora of owners in a network configuration. And of course, in this network configuration, it's far easier for a whole lot of actors to participate in it than it is in a monopolized terrain like this. Um, I'll maybe leave it at this, but this is part of a big uh, speculation of ours on how contemporary capitalism organizes and reorganizes society um, and how real misery is spread with the help of architects and planners. Um, making new configurations, spatial configurations, to allow for monopolizing economic opportunity, which of course is in the, uh, not in the interest of the poorest of the poor in our cities. So this research project, Ways of Living, is a research project that uh, has been going on for about 10 years, where we've been looking at just how do people live in the context of poverty? What uh, what are residential spaces like? What are entertainment spaces like? What are business spaces like? And what can we learn from that as ways of which people actually live in the city um, as a lesson uh, from people who shape the city to their heart's desire to the professionals who shape it on behalf of others to try and think what we can do, what we can learn from citizens, and what we can do to shape the city in a more uh, just kind of a way. Um, now, one of this, because we've taken so long studying this, we've been able to study the dynamic of the city unfolding over time and seeing how government subsidized houses developed. Here you see a house in the middle of a property developed as part of the reconstruction and development program and the idea that government provides a subsidized house. But then seeing what happens over time as people have to adjust this thing that is conceived of as a house, as a more generic architectural instrument that is both house and something else. So the study basically finds that all of these subsidized houses become what we call specialized houses in that they are businesses and houses. There are hair care centers, they are daycare centers. They very often get demolished, like you see in this animation, and then they get reconstructed as something else, but always remaining a house nonetheless. So this is an actual example of a property where somebody took a house subsidized by government, demolished it in its entirety, and rebuilt it at 10 times the density, um, providing 10 times the amount of residential opportunities and a business inside there. So there is a general grocer inside this building and somebody is then building inside this property and then realizing that people are building shacks around it in the property and saying, but if others can build in what's in style called informality, so can we. And then building brick structures over the boundary and then making a new structure. Um, uh, what we did is to try and study um, the nature of houses and buildings people build for themselves. So I can just briefly go over some of these conclusions. The one is to look at the economics of this. And very often in South Africa, there's the tendency of talking about the first economy and the second economy, basically white and black or legal, illegal, um, being very broad here. But for me, these have been very uh, unproductive categories. One is because they're segregatory. But two is that you do not understand the economy of the city by itself. So for instance, we proved by our economic research into these residential units that per square meter, the residential rentals here are equivalent to those uh, in the most expensive parts of the city. So this neighborhood on the periphery of the city is as expensive as the seaside beach resorts in the city. Then we looked at formal infrastructure, in this case, a taxi rank that's provided. And we're very interested in this, that this formal infrastructure is hardly used. It's sort of used adjacent to it. But then a whole series of containers arrive here where they are secondary businesses that live off what we call a primary business. 
And then outside of these containers, there are people there washing cars, fixing cars, doing all sorts of things. That's really tertiary businesses. And this interrelationship between primary, secondary, and tertiary businesses has been of huge interest to us. And we will show you how that had relevance in our world later. This is one of those containers. You can see part of our study, we would draw absolutely everything that we find inside spaces that we could go into. And we are very interested in the socialization that is fundamental to labor, to work, to running a shop and to hanging out. So one person owns the shop and runs it, but these are friends going around here. Here's a secondary business a person on foot. But this is another kind of a case showing the development of a specialized house. This is a, um, a subsidized house developed by government with a series of additions, additions made by the owner to it. This is a house at night. During the day, it's a daycare center. Um, and here you find the owner with a bunch of children inside there. And we were studying the density of children inside these spaces, and looking how these government subsidized houses, as crudely as they are designed, as ill-conceived as they may be, provide a minimum threshold to enter into the economy for the woman who own these houses and to run daycare centers and provide a social service. In the same neighborhood that we studied, we looked at these cul de sacs that were designed by the original planners. Um, um, and we were very interested in this bit of infrastructure because in the photo here on the right, what you see is that this infrastructure has generally been adopted by men who run car repair um, facilities here. You can have your windscreen replaced, your engine fixed, your tires uh, fixed, all sorts of things done here. And what is a sheet of tarmac conceived of as a, a, a neighborhood binding device for the houses around it has become an economic infrastructure. So this idea that our task as designers is as much to develop economic opportunity and infrastructure for economic opportunity as social opportunity is significant in the work that we've done. So, um, one of the projects that we did while we were doing this research was a project in the VNA waterfront in Cape Town. We were approached to do a business incubator there. And we, uh, we were approached together with a whole lot of architects. And we had a sense that people knew that we had a, a reputation, but not that they know what our reputation was about. They certainly did not know that I did my thesis at University of Cape Town on how to destroy the typology of shopping mall as a way of undoing the monopolization inherent in these kinds of sites. So we were approached to make a business incubator in a portion of this building that a sort of steel interior, old electric workshop with a wooden floor. And the yellow area in this diagram was the area given to us to inhabit and make a kind of an interior, make this business incubator. And we thought that that was the wrong move. And we convinced the client to do something else. And that is to use the entire building um, for this business incubator and not have the business incubator on the ground floor because we thought it had very little business on the ground floor. But to do what business incubators do and, and, uh, and to demonstrate how business opportunity can be generated, uh, not just through lecturing, but through spatial morphology, through the way they locate themselves in the city. And also in a way to acknowledge the complicity of big business in making the city less fair, less equal, and fewer opportunities to participate. So we said, well, why does the business incubator not locate itself on the first floor and then uh, remove itself from the ground floor and make a whole lot of business opportunities below it in a street configuration, a very typical urban configuration, but instead of making an interior, uh, a, as part of this commission, as we were commissioned, actually make an exterior and make a network that connects with a network. So make a piece of urban infrastructure that connects with this network. So you see this whole lot of dots here. This is the building here. And there's a very successful mall here and a very successful uh, bit of uh, urban infrastructure, pedestrian infrastructure. And what we did is we connected that through this building um, and created economic opportunities with that. So this is a plan of the building in a way showing this plethora of small shops. So the idea of having a very big street here and then a whole lot of tiny shops 
two square meters, four square meters, six square meters, and you know, unlike the 300, 400, 500 square meters shops that you find in the malls around it. So tiny little opportunities. And um, this building, I believe, has been uh, one of the most successful buildings in the country in its income per square meter, just because of the way it deals with the footfall. And then what we said is in architectural terms is instead of expressing this building by what it looks like, express it in the way that it works. So this is the reflected ceiling plan. And this is the underside of this hovering plane that makes this market space possible. This is the hovering plane here. And there is this big market underneath it. And the business incubator actually sits up here. So it makes a big open public space, completely open to the outside with interior spaces of the business incubator here overlooking it and interior spaces over here overlooking it. And all of these then looking down onto the market that you see here. And this is the main street where you're walking and there hovers the business incubator in the distance. So here you see it in its urban context uh, of the waterfront. Um, and this is the street looking right down. So here you see some of the shops, they're a bit more closed here where the weather is getting to them, but you can see it's open to the elements. The street articulated architecturally with a roof light that runs right through the length. And there in the distance, you see the business incubator hovering. This is the market down below and the business incubator up above. And there's a, a reciprocal relationship between these two. It's, more equal in our mind. So one is people in business, maybe aspiring to learn a bit more about business development, and then people upstairs who are learning academically in a way about business advancement, seeing people trading and trading and trading all day, and being in the context of that being demonstrated to them. Uh, you see the edge of the hovering plane and the sort of treed spaces that we made next to it. And here you see this is a two square meter shop. This is a four, uh, sorry, this is a two square meter shop, a sort of very, I'm sorry, basic trolley that can be pushed into a very, very busy space. This is a four square meter shop. This is a six square meter shop uh, where people are selling stuff. There's a whole lot of touristy things in these image, images, but they are jewelry, clothing, beauty uh, things, all sorts of leather goods and so on, also being made in the same space. Oops, I'm going wrong. Then up above, you have the business incubator, where you can see a very transparent building, not really much defined by what it looks like, but really defined by this open heart. So we convince the owners uh, of the business incubator to have the cafeteria right on the center, and this is really open to the elements. So there's a roof over, but it's open on the side of the building. Uh, as a social space, that forms the heart of it, then on the side, as the, the business incubator next to it. But the attempt in this project was to say, how can physical infrastructure that serves one purpose be designed in such a manner that it opens up opportunities for completely other actors outside of the ambit of something like this business incubator, but that can have mutually beneficial roles and can build an urbanity that has a greater density of use. I'm going to move along from here. Okay. Um, should we uh, wrap up and open up for questions soon? That's all right. Okay. We we probably have about four or five projects still, but um, if you want us to wrap up, we can wrap up here. Yeah, I think um, maybe what I can just say is that. Um, our projects are generally thinking through how do we um, gather wisdom from this research that we that we that we that we acquire, not as a way of gathering knowledge, but as a way of thinking through some very very difficult issues. And on the one hand, our practice is advocating against anti-blackness, but on the other hand, through through these projects of research of the you know the the, the ways of living the um, crime of our time and um, some some other ideas around how do we analyze critically analyze the spatial legacies of anti-blackness in our society we've got a few more projects that we could elaborate on in, in, a, in a much more way for instance this Boshanel project and um, you know, the, 
other projects in our office, it, it becomes a mantra. But on the other hand, we're also thinking through how do we celebrate blackness in and the contribution of, um, of, of architects of, of in, 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 in the kind of sense of the way Bessie Head would make a garden and a house and the way Winston Mankumpungozi wrote that song that is then encapsulates the Lakshurama. So how do we think through these two sort of poles that um, of, of how do we critically analyze anti-blackness but at the same time becomes a, um, um, a practice of celebrating blackness um, in, in the sense of, of of all these players, so Plyke, Bessie Head, um, Winston Mankungozi, Mankunku, and um, the various architectural projects that we imagine in our office. We've got a lot more to say, but I think we'll leave it like we leave it there. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, Mai, would you like to lead the Q&A session? Sure. Um, Ilta and Harish, thank you so much for your talk. Um, I wish we had more time. Uh, so to the first question, um, it's about the University of Western Cape um, Center for Humanities Research. So how does your conceptualization of rooms that listen relate to your own practices of listening? Um, what advice do you have with regard to listening practices for attentive, reflective practitioners outside of your own craft? Um, how does Blackness, anti-Blackness, whiteness affect the practice of listening? Um, this is from Gideon Strauss. Okay, so I think it's got to do with humility and how does one spatialize humility? How does one enter a space with humility and that performative nature of not um, taking up space through the body or through your, your performative nature of, um, of, of being, um, but at the same time, how does one um, make space for collectivity? And in that sense, you know, it's really about how, does, how do you read the room? How do you read the room with people in it? And how do you read the room without people in it? Um, and, and, and what is the spatial kind of um, thinking through that? So, yes, yeah, so this, is, this is essentially an idea that we, that, that we, um, that we uh, that emerge from looking very carefully at the spatial practices of the University of the Western Cape, who, um, you know, there is a, there, there's a sense of um, other ways of spatializing, um, spatial, making space and making rooms for listening rather than rooms that dictate um, a certain kind of performance. Do you want to say something? Yeah, about? I can just say one of the other things to be conscious, particularly when we're doing buildings, uh, is that um, there's a variety of different interests. You know, we do a lot of government buildings. Unfortunately, I didn't get to show any of this now. But um, uh, what you have is that you have uh, various interested parties. You know, you, if you're doing, say, a big hospital like we have for 13 years, you're dealing with the Department of Health, Department of Works, you're dealing with hospital administration staff, maintenance people, um, you are healthcare workers, cleaners, all sorts of people, and everybody has a completely different interest in this artifact that you are asked to design and help build and so on. And there's something about being able to listen to all of them and being able to honor all of them in what is being said. Because of course, only one pays your bills and only one approves your plans. But there's something about making sure that everybody will be excited about the project, but uh, they will be excited in a way if they see something of what they've seen shaping the building. And, um, and not just as a kind of a respect to what has been said, but really understanding what is the interest of a maintenance person who has to reach something over their heads versus a nurse who has to walk many miles versus somebody who's trying to make government buildings equivalent wherever they do in the province or something like that. Um, and there's something about um, letting those um, concerns really shape the architecture. One is, I think, then one's more likely to get the buildings built, but also you're more likely that people genuinely like and appreciate the buildings when they're done. Thank you. Um, so the second question that we have is from Takuzwa Tatsuma. Um, so thank you for your talk. Uh, I'm a black graduate student from Zimbabwe, and I'm especially excited that you joined us today. Um, uh, his question is, although we often hear of global architectural practice, the conversation around the meaning of a global architectural education is less developed. 
both of you having participated in global cultural and architectural exchanges, um, what are the essential components of a truly global architectural education? Yeah, it's a very good question. You know, and I, I think the first is to know global architectural history. You know, I don't know how many universities on this planet teach us global architectural history. Most universities teach European architectural history. Um, and with tiny little smatterings of the other thrown in there, you know, um, sometimes with uh, uh, greater or less enthusiasm and knowledge behind it. But um, generally, um, architectural graduates don't have a sense, a well-developed sense of global architecture uh, uh, history throughout the ages, but also of contemporary architectural unfolding. You know, so if you look at, say, uh, the Pritzker Prize and how um, Western its recipients are, you would think that all great architects are in essence male and from the Western world, which of course is rubbish and a disgrace. Um, and one does not get a lens onto the greatness of architectural practitioners through the Pritzker. For instance, it has a certain way in which it works. But, uh, you know, I think that uh, there is something in having to educate yourself. One is about the conditions of your city and telling those stories back to the world. Um, and then being open to other such stories being told by others in the world and trying to appreciate the terms on which they practice. Because to practice in uh, the Congo is different from practicing in Japan, is different from being in Venice and so on. And the sense of history is different. The sense of what is possible is different and so on. And I think it's, uh, uh, there are very few international publications that assist us in this day to get an, an, a balanced understanding of what it is like to practice in different parts of the world. Yeah. I also think that through our talk, I hope we've um, managed to communicate this point of paying attention in terms of the mm -hmm. fact that a global architectural practice needs to, or global architectural education needs to pay attention to what's pretty much in front of us um, in, is in terms of what is the most local, what is the most immediate knowledge or wisdom around you. And um, I've also learned that one cannot think about education um, if your disciplinary realms are very strict. So an architectural education does not mean that you constrain yourself with the architectural knowledge. There is spatial knowledge and wisdoms around space that are found in music, in literature, in poetry, in dance, in sport, in leisure, and there are people um, within those disciplines that stand out as contributing towards a particular kind of architectural education through their various attitudes on space. Um, and I think one needs to think of an education not necessarily as global or local, but as broad and um, enduring, um, and that 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 it, that supports and is supported by other disciplines. Um, that's a, that is that is sort of how we go about thinking through educating ourselves, at least. Thank you very much. Um, so the, another question, um, I think this is relating to your project in Langa. Um, this is from Tessa Bard. Um, I was wondering about your mapping of infrastructure and land ownership uh, relates to any spatial plan and development policy that the city government has and how directly you see this project as activism and pressure directed at the city to develop a more propositional policy that might address anti-black spatial division. Thank you again. Well, um, it is um, as much focused at the city as it is focused at uh, politicians, as it's focused at economists or architects. It's not just the city. I mean, the, the city certainly uh, shapes policy that is significant in the city, certainly allows some of these things because they have to give uh, uh, land use planning permission and so on uh, for these things. But I, I think for us as a first step is to point out the complicity of architects in this, um, simply because um, uh, to many people, it appears that the escalation of inequality is a mystery, um, as if it's an inaccessible, uh, unstoppable force 
uh, with no hand behind it. And we want to show is that there's design behind it. So there's political intent. Um, uh, so there are political entities uh, who are supporting this. There's cities supporting it. And there are designers supporting it. So the escalation of inequality is designed um, uh, with uh, a sort of premeditative actions behind it. And uh, permissions are given and put out in the public realm for comment, but people don't necessarily understand what amassment of rights are given to the few. Uh, and hence the, the privilege is so immense that's given out in such an approval is that the objections are actually very few at the time when it happened. Um, so what we are trying to show is how this occurs and reoccurs as a way of um, talking to all citizens in a way uh, from uh, grassroots political activists to city government to uh, whatever other academic uh, institutions uh, to try and foster conversation about these forces at play um, because uh, I think that they have to be reversed and the manner in which um, the urban fabric is plowed open, you know, like land is tilled in a way and broken up as a way of giving more people right to the city to shape it to the heart's desire, as uh, David Harvey would say, uh, is a, a, a battle that we have at the moment, you know, it's like a battle for the city, basically. I think Jane Jacobs came up with that term, but um, we, we basically have this um, political contestation uh, in the context of a black vote in South Africa, that the question is whether one could retain a white a mon a monopoly cap uh, a capitalist system um, through uh, the way the city is organized and so on. And uh, the research does not just then speak to the city, it speaks to a broader audience as well. I don't know if that answers the question. Perhaps going off of that, um, I wonder, what you see the architect's role in um, buildings over time. So you have the original intent as the architect to provide a space. Um, I think you were saying um, at the beginning that architect, like the aim is not to construct architecture, but it's actually to create a space that could perform. So how do you, how do you think architects would should be involved in seeing that through as the building is used over time? especially in cases where the user and the owner of that building or that space is not the same. Um, this is a question that a group of students were discussing yesterday about your works. Yeah, the, the extraordinary thing is that an architect cannot see it through, so to speak. In other words, you're not there to keep on guiding the process necessarily. Very often you do a building and you're not consulted uh, uh, 10 years later when changes are made. Um, and in that sense, there's something about the notion of infrastructure. Unfortunately, I could not show the hospital that we've been working on for 13 years, but that very seriously considers this idea of what we call a superstructure versus a substructure. So in the case of um, 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 the watershed, the superstructure um, just a moment, is a... Um, uh, the, the superstructure is an urban infrastructure, you know, so um, th this idea of superstructure relates to this idea of infrastructure, that infrastructure, you know, like Ida Drogov said, is a, a politics by itself that sometimes endures beyond political ideology. Um, and the idea, for instance, that there's a street that's made through a building where trade can happen along it, and that you sort of unleash the unstoppable force of a sort of an urban street or the fragmentation of urban opportunities around it. You know, in the case of a hospital, we had a sense that there's a sort of principal infrastructure of a roof and columns and so on, with a substructure of walls and so on that can change over time. But it is to um, make sure that very often the urban attitudes are very strong and the architectural attitudes stop before we start doing everything and you stop earlier than you think and you leave the building open to be adjusted. Um, you know, so um, I did not focus much on that in the watershed. I can maybe just flash back very quickly. But if you look 
at the market inside, there are these sub elements, all of which we designed. We designed this, we designed this, we designed this, and all of it was made so it can be changed over time. You can rip out the shells, you can paint it pink, you can throw the elements away, and the architecture can in a way be devoured. Then there's another infrastructural piece, it's far more permanent, that in a way facilitates this opportunity. So this balance between changeable parts and uh, more infrastructural parts, because infrastructural parts don't necessarily have such a strong appearance, but they make certain actions possible. And then other parts have weaker appearance, like this element. You can see this architecture is far stronger in its language, and this is far weaker in its language. But its weakness, in a way, allows it to be devoured without consequence and be transformed and changed. And so do we make other buildings where the walls and so on can be taken up without it fundamentally changing the architecture. Um, with the infrastructure performing its connective action or its benefits as it did in the beginning, but allowing people to act on it in different ways over time. Mm -hmm. I think that's what we aim for. Yeah, I mean, I also think that one mustn't imagine ourselves at the center of the project in, in a constant way. You know, um, the, a project, architectural projects are collective efforts from various, um, you know, collectives forming from um, the people paying for it, the people that will be inhabiting it, people um, introducing the program. We bring a sort of technical expertise to a project that um, imagines the um, spatial, um, the spatial interventions of a various set of collectives and collective thought. And I think if one takes seriously this idea that an architectural project is a collective project, then one must really pay serious attention to a collective responsibility um, where everybody has their own expertise, expertise and, um, and, and brings their own custodianship to the collective imagination. So um, yes, we do have a role in the enduring um, sustenance of a project, but I think one needs to be completely humble about that role and um, advocate for a collective custodianship of each project. Thank you both uh, so much. Unfortunately, we're just running out of time. Studio is about to um, start. But on behalf of the Rice School of Architecture, I'd like to thank you both, Ilsa and Heinrich, for the incredible talk and sharing with us your, your work and research. Um, it was really incredible. Um, and to our audience, um, thank you all for tuning in uh, this afternoon. And please join us next week for a talk on the Affordable Housing Lab with our very own associate professor, Jesus Vassar. Thank you very much.